Thank you, Jean. If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 1. This is a freebie. Just before we read, let me make a comment. There is a trend in the wider church today, which I think is a bit disturbing. I've heard it from young believers, I've heard it from older believers, and I've heard it fairly commonly, which is why I want to make the comment. And that is that there is a tendency for people to talk about God. You say, well, that's no bad thing. Well, the point of the thing is that the way to God is Jesus. And there are an awful lot of people who are simply saying, God did this, God did that, God did the other. I don't doubt that that's true. But I think we need to be very careful that we don't somehow or other trivialize God himself and at the same time put Jesus somewhere in the background. Jesus shall take the highest honor. He is the preeminent one. He is the supreme one. And really that's to some extent, what we want to talk about tonight from Hebrews chapter 1, the first three verses, which say, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. There's a verse that I want to leave with you in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1. And the reason I look at that before we get into these three verses here is this, that it is so clearly stated Paul here says, the point of what we are saying is, how often do you get it as clearly as that? How often do you read the Scriptures and say, I, I wonder what he means, I wonder where he's coming from, I wonder what the idea is? Well, you're not left in any doubt in Hebrews, because in Hebrews chapter 1, uh, as Hebrews chapter 8, rather, verses 1 and 2, the Word says, the point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. If we were doing a full study of the book of Hebrews, we would begin with the idea, which comes through Hebrews very strongly, that Jesus is preeminent. He's above everything else. He's above everybody else. But some of that will come out in the three verses we're going to look at tonight. I've called this the credentials of the Christ. This is who He is. This is who He is. And as we begin, we read, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Those two little words, sundry times and divers manners, are very significant because in effect they are saying to us, God in days gone by, spoke at different times with different bits here and there, but he never gave the whole story. You go through the prophets of the Old Testament and you get some of the story. You go to Isaiah 53, you get a picture of the suffering Christ. You go to other verses of Scripture and you get indications of where Jesus was going to be born. The fact that he was going to go into Egypt while still an infant. Various things like that, bits and pieces all the way through in the Old Testament. If you take the Old Testament as a whole, you build up a fairly strong picture of what God is saying to his ancient people initially. When you come to the book of Hebrews, the Word is saying quite clearly that the God who spoke in fragments, in bits and pieces, sometimes this way, sometimes that way, in the past, has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. 
And the import and the, the impact that that makes is seen in John 14, where the disciples say, we would like to see God. Now, they weren't alone in that, because Moses, many, many years before, had said the same thing. Let me see you. God says, you can't see me. And so here are the disciples in John 14, just before Jesus goes to the cross, and they're saying, show us the Father, we'll be satisfied. And Jesus says, he that has seen me has seen the Father also. And so we have to think about that as we come to these few verses. We're going to look at just what marks the Lord Jesus Christ as superior and supreme in the whole of the universe. In the first instance, he is for us, God's final word. There are people who would tell you that God is speaking to us today, and so he is. But it would be generally right to say that he's speaking to us through the word. There are some people who are hearing indications of what God has to say. Across the Middle East at the moment, the reports are such that Muslims are having visions, seeing Jesus, Jesus is telling them to go see somebody who will tell them about himself. But nobody is giving any kind of indication that God is appearing either in visions or in dreams and giving new information that is not already in the Scriptures. The Bible, which tells us about Jesus, which gives us the picture that we have of Jesus, is God's final word. God, who in times past spoke, has in these last days. Gene was singing about the second coming. These last days are upon us. If we were to study through Thessalonians and, and various other scriptures, we would be assured, we would be convinced that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, that Jesus is coming soon, that his footfall is at the doors. There are very few, if any, major prophecies still to be fulfilled before Jesus will come back again. And the turmoil amongst the nations that you're seeing at the present time is an indication of that. The so-called Arab Spring, which is really an Arab winter and is not finished yet, not finished yet by a long way. But all of that that's going on in the world today is an indication that Jesus is coming again. And so he is God's final word. Listen to what he says. He has in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. The ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is to tell us what God thinks, is to explain to us what God's views are, is to show us the way to God, is to reveal to us that he and he alone is the mediator between God and men. Book of Hebrews, again, in the wider expanse, talks about the comparative uh, relationship of Jesus as a priest to the priesthood of Aaron and the priesthood of Melchizedek. And on both occasions where it's talking about the priesthood, it's making the point very clearly. Jesus is a higher order of priesthood than any of them. These priests had to make a sacrifice for themselves. Jesus never had to do that. These priests had to shed the blood of animals in order to get into the presence of God. Jesus didn't have to do that. He shed his own blood. He made himself a willing sacrifice when he went to the cross. And so when you look at Jesus, you are seeing God's last word, God's final answer. We have to be careful that we don't sideline Jesus, that we don't put him on one side and say, well, you know, he, he might have been a good man. Maybe he was a prophet. No, no, he was more than that. He was God the Son. And as God the Son, he was God's final word to us. But notice, if you will, as you read on, that he is also the future heir. He hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Heir of all things. So there's a day coming when Jesus will take up his inheritance. What does the Bible say about that? Psalm 2, verse 8, ask of me. This is God speaking. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. The intention of God was always that Jesus would be the plan of salvation, that Jesus in his life and death 
would give his life a ransom for the souls of men, that he would shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world, the Bible says. Always God's plan. But you'll notice that here in the psalm, God says, ask me, ask me. And you know, we sometimes take it for granted on the basis of Scripture. The Scripture says, before you call, I will answer. And somehow or other, we think that some times when we've got a problem, God's going to answer before we even ask the question. But there are times when God says, ask of me. Ask of me. In Malachi, talking about giving, he says, prove me. Try me out. See how it works. Make the effort. Put yourself in line for, for a test. Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. But Paul, as he writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 1, he says this, I pray that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, that's Jesus' calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, you need to read the context to get the whole meaning of that, but you'll notice this, that Paul sees the riches of the glory of the inheritance in the saints. You see, Jesus, heir of all things, is going to inherit you and me. Isn't that tremendous? You and I are settled. We are sealed. It's all signed. It only remains to be delivered. One day we're going home to glory. One day we're going to see him face to face. And if here it is, what does the hymn say? If here it is so blessed, what will it be up there? We can't begin to imagine or understand what it will be to see him. Just imagine, there will be no need for sun or moon or stars, but the light of that land will be the sun himself. And you and I, who today, if we looked at the natural sun, would find ourselves blinded by its brightness, will stand in the amazing glory of the Son of God who illuminates the whole of the new Jerusalem, and we will be able to see him as perfectly as ever. You won't need the specs. Wouldn't that be great? Are you still there? There's a lot of advertising now about laser surgery. I tell you, you won't need laser surgery then. You'll be able to be there. You'll see him. And the Bible says you'll know, even as also you are known. He's the future heir. Everything that is coming, everything that's prepared. And the Bible says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But those things will be ours, yours, mine. If we are children of God, that's what's waiting for you. Don't be worrying about selling your house to pay for your old age pension and your, and your care in the care home. Jesus will be back before that. Okay. Panic not. Panic not. You can always go to the, the housing executive or whatever they call themselves. They'll help you out, maybe. You see, we do get out of panic for these things, don't we? We look down the road a bit and we say, oh, well, it could be difficult. It could be a problem. We might have this not, and we might not have this, and we might not have that. Wait, I tell you, you are held in the hollow of his hand. You are the apple of his eye. You are his inheritance. He's not going to let you go. He's going to make sure that you make it. Glory be to God. You imagine back in the old ages, you know, when martyrs would be tied up to a stake uh, and they'd be brushwood all around about the bottom of, them, bottom of them and there'd somebody be setting a light to it and they'd be standing there saying, thank you Jesus, I'm glad I'm going to see you any minute now. Wow. I mean, for us, if we burn our finger a wee bit or we give ourselves a wee blister because we hit it with a hammer, boy, we're jumping. But you know, in the days gone by, there were people, you read it in the end of Hebrews chapter 11, people who were sawn asunder, people who were thrown to the lions. They tell me this, that because of the situation in Rome, a Christian's life was not worth very much. The bishop of Rome was get always, not, not the same one, but whoever was the bishop of Rome was forever getting martyred, thrown to the lions. But the record says there was never any shortage of candidates for the job. How about that? I would love to be a martyr for Jesus, was what they were saying. Why? Because their inheritance was secure. They knew 
that they had an, uh, an interest, or Jesus had an interest in them, as well as them having an interest in him. So he's the future heir. And then we read, by whom also he made the world. He's the first cause. The, the scientists want to know, how did it all start? And, you know, they're very clever, some of these scientists. They, they go backwards. Well, they've got to go backwards because they couldn't go forwards, half of them. But they go backwards, you know, and they start from where they are, and they say, this is what we can see, and that's what must have happened to get us to where we are. And if you go back a bit further, then it must have been like that before it was like this. And they go as far back as they can get, even to the primordial soup we were talking about this morning. And then they're stuck. And then they're stuck. And you say, well, where did the primordial soup come from? Ah, well... Mm. Yes. Mm. Well, there must have been a first cause. Yeah. So what was the first cause? Who was the first cause? Well, you see, the world came into existence because of the Big Bang. What went bang? Where did what went bang come from? No wonder the Bible talks about science falsely so-called. See, my understanding of the word science means it's based on a word that means to know. Okay? And they don't. They can guess, they can hypothesize, they can have theories all over the place, but they don't know. And they don't know because the only way to know is through faith. And the only way to have faith is to look at God and to believe what God has to say. And when you believe what God has to say, you get a word that says this, by whom, speaking of Jesus, he also made the worlds. John 1.1, 1, 1, we mentioned it this morning, he came, unto his, he came unto his own. He did, later in John. But in John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Without him was not anything made that was made. So whether it was uh, way back when, it really doesn't make a lot of difference. The beginning was Jesus. He was the Word of God. He was the one who got it all together. Not only that, but He controls everything. We'll come to that in a wee minute because He touches on that as well. So the first cause. Colossians 1 and verse 16 says, By Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Now, I have a problem with that verse. I'm sure all the scientists do, but there's a wee word in there that really makes all the difference, and it's the word all. If I say to you, you close your ears a wee minute because you don't want to hear this. If I say to you, you can all come back to our house for supper the night, <laughs> once you've picked my wife up off the floor, what would you think I meant? Some of you go out that door, and if I made that statement to you, some of you go out that door and say, but did he mean me? And your friend would say to you, well, what did he say? Well, he said, you're all invited. Well, how would he get all of us into that house that he lives in? Not my problem. His problem. He said, you're all invited. So there's not one person going out of those doors tonight, if I made that kind of an invitation to you, who would be entitled, who would be entitled to say, I can't go, I'm not invited. The word all is inclusive. The word all means all. It doesn't say all except. It doesn't all say all but. It says all. And once you have said all, there's nowhere else to go. And so when you come to this verse in Colossians 1.16, Paul said, by him were... No, couldn't read that. It would be an awful lot easier if we could say, by him were most things created. Uh, or by him were some things created. We could live with that. But all things... Not only that, we're talking not just about what we can see here, physically, round about us in the material world. It says that are in heaven. So he made the things in the heavens as well. 
Well, if you go back to Genesis, it says he made the stars also. I mean, it's so casual, isn't it? He made the sun to rule by day. He made the moon to rule by night. And then it says, and he made the stars as well. Wow. And here you've got it. Things in heaven, things on earth. Well, all right. But then it, it qualifies it a wee bit more. It says, things which you can see, and even things which you can't see. Those things we talked about this morning, what do we call them? Dozons, bosons, or somebody. Protons, nucleons. You can name it what you like. There is absolutely no way you can escape the written word of God, which says, by him were all things created, which are in heaven or on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by him and for him. You can't get away from it. There is no escape. Jesus is the first cause of everything. Then, notice he's the fullness of the Godhead. This strange person, this invisible person, this person who is described in John's gospel as the Word. I mean, can you see words? Only if you write them down. Only if you print them out. Words. You read your wee comics, you buy your dandy and your bino, and the words become things in wee balloons from the people's mouths. That's about as close as you're going to get. But I mean, you and I talk, you don't see the words, you can hear the words, you don't see the words. And so here's this invisible person using invisible words. And out of that invisibility, there's something fantastic appears. I mentioned it before a long time ago, but if you haven't seen just how fantastic and you've got a computer and you're on the internet, go into Google and Google Hubble the telescope that's in outer space, and have a look at what's out there. You and I have never seen it with the natural eye. You have to be up there to see it. But when you see it, it is absolutely mind-boggling. It is literally out of this world. Colors, designs, shapes, whatever's there is absolutely beyond the imagination of man. But it's all there. And so we have here the fullness of the Godhead, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The brightness indicates radiance. The express image means the exact representation. Show us the Father. He that has seen me has seen the Father. I am the exact representation of the Father. You want to know what the Father looks like? You want to know how the Father behaves? You want to know what the Father does? See me. Look at what I do. Look at how I live. Look at how I behave. Look at the way I speak to people. I'm your answer. I'm your answer. Radiance. You have disciples on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration. And Jesus is transfigured before them. And they look at him and they are so gobsmacked by it all. They say, let's build three little booths. Peter always had foot and mouth disease. You know that, don't you? Peter says, let, let, let's build three wee tents. And Father God says to him, this is my beloved son. Listen to what he's got to say. But you see, he is the fullness of the Godhead. Everything that you imagine God to be, Jesus is. Everything that you can't imagine God to be, Jesus is. Everything that God is, Jesus is. He is as God as God is. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There is absolutely no difference in essence between them. Let's hurry on very quickly. There are three more areas here mentioned. He is the functionary of all things. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Isn't that amazing? You're going to get up in the morning? Is the sun going to rise tomorrow? You sure about that? Well, it's done it for all the years that I've been alive since, you know, and, and I expect it will do it again tomorrow. How is it going to do that? Well, you see, it's part of the universe, and it's out there, and, and you know, it just goes in the orbit that it's supposed to go in. Is that so? 
we went to Egypt a few years ago, and we were sitting uh, in one of the, the big uh, amphitheaters at a, a sound and light presentation. And I think I was the only one that saw it. I was the only one with my head up, everybody else with their eyes down, but I had my head up. And in the black night sky of Egypt, there was a shooting star of brightness that I'd never seen before. Absolutely amazing, right across the sky. How did it get to be a shooting star? Well, Jesus must have said, hey, you, you can go. And it went. And it wasn't there anymore. <coughs> Why? Because everything else in the universe is held in place by his word. He says the word, it all falls apart. You stop and think about it. Historically, we haven't time to go into it in detail, but historically, how do you think Israel has survived to today? How do you think they came through the, the 1967 war? How did they survive the Holocaust? I tell you how. Because there's a God in heaven who's got everything in his hands and under his control. And even though we may not understand how things are working out at times, we are assured of this, that our God in heaven has everything, but everything, under control. He is the functioner. He's the facilitator. He's the, the, the one who's holding all things. Colossians 1.17 says, He is before all things, and by him all things consist. They're still there. Then we come to the crunch point for tonight. He's the forgiver of sins. Notice what it says here. When he had by himself purged our sins. How did he do that? You see, in the context of the Hebrews and the context of the rest of the book, you might have expected something to be said about him making some kind of a sacrifice that would appease a, an angry God and would allow men to come close to that God. It doesn't say that. It says that he himself, no animals, no beasts, no sacrifices, he by himself did all that was necessary to forgive you and me our sins. Isn't that tremendous? He purged them. He purged them. He cleaned them out of the way. He dealt with them. If tonight you're here and you, you've never had your sins purged, you're still living with them in your heart and in your life. You're still carrying them about as a burden on your back. You know full well that you're not ready to meet God. You know full well that you're not ready to stand in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ because of your sin. Because the Bible says about heaven, nothing that defiles and sin defiles shall ever enter in there. And so you know in your heart, you don't need me to tell you, you don't need any preacher to tell you, you know that you are not ready to meet God. But Jesus is not the problem. You are. See, Jesus has done all that needed to be done for you to be forgiven. The Bible says he by himself purged our sins. And when he did it, when he did it, if you look at the next bit, he became the finisher of our faith. He sat down. When you go back to the Old Testament and you look at the priestly uh, activities of the Old Testament, they were based on the, the temple and before that on the tabernacle. When the priest came into the tent of the tabernacle or when he came into the temple, there was never any seat. There were no seats, there were no chairs in the tabernacle or in the, tent, uh, or in the, the temple. And the reason for that was that the high priest's work was never done. The ordinary priests, they were in and out every day. They had to keep the light burning. They had to do things with the, the special bread that lay on a, on a wee table at the side. They had work to do within the temple. But there was never a seat. There was never a place for them to sit down. And even on the Day of Atonement, the tradition says that when the high priest was going in on the Day of Atonement, which was only once a year, they would tie a rope around his ankle in case he got killed while he was in there. If he wasn't there... Uh, acceptably to God, then God would strike him down dead. 
because you cannot stand in the presence of Almighty God unclean. And so they tie a rope round about his, his ankle to pull him back out if he did collapse. And when he was going in, he put on a special robe, and the special robe had wee uh, pomegranate-shaped bells round about the bottom of it. And they used to be quiet and listen for the bells. If they could hear the bells, he was still moving. But what does it say about Jesus? He sat down. He sat down. And you know, the only other time that you hear about Jesus standing up again was when Stephen was martyred. And the Bible says he saw heaven opened and Jesus standing, waiting to receive him, waiting to welcome him home. Until that moment, and from that moment till now, he has sat down. He has sat down. And the implication is that he has finished the work that he came to do. Here's a question. You'll find it in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. All of that highlights the reality of who Jesus is, of how special he is, of how wonderful he is, how gracious, how merciful, how loving he is. And although he's God, yet he became man so that he might purge our sins and forgive us and make us a way to get back into God's presence. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3 leaves you with a question. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? See, you can listen to all of that. You can read those three verses again for yourself, and you can say to yourself, my, Jesus was a wonderful person, and these are wonderful scriptures, and it's marvelous just to, to think about these things. But unless you do something about it, you remain in your sin. If you remain in your sin, there is no hope. There is no future. There is no door into heaven for you. And so tonight, before you go home, when you go home, when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, how will you escape what? The judgment of God. If you neglect, I'm not antagonistic. It doesn't say antagonistic, it says neglect. You can have a neglected garden. It doesn't mean to say you hate your garden. It just means you can't be bothered doing anything about it. And the same is true with your relationship with Jesus. Well, you know, I've heard this so many times and I can't be bothered. I don't want to change. I'm happy the way I am. That's neglect. And the question that is being asked tonight quite simply is, how will you escape the judgment of God if you neglect God's salvation? Let's pray. Father, as we come to the conclusion of the service tonight, we thank you for the one who is our Savior. We thank you, Lord, for he is high and lifted up. His train fills the temple. We thank you that you've given unto him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, Lord, we pray that your word will find an entrance into our hearts, will be mixed with faith in the hearts of those who hear. And should there be those, Lord, here tonight who do not know you personally, open their heart to yourself. Draw them to yourself. Make them yours, O God, and glorify your own name. Help the angels to rejoice over one sinner that repents and be glorified in a transformed life. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen.